just while everybody's joining us, I'll just fill everybody in on just the current status with all the courses, because we had had quite a lot of inquiries about um, the various courses. Um, so all, obviously all the 2017 courses are running through at the moment. We are taking bookings for the residential course, which is starting in September 2018. So we are starting taking bookings for those now. The postgraduate certificate online, the level one, that's open to purchase now. And the first module um, will be released on the 5th of February for you. And exciting news as well, the clinical occlusion, the three day online course is now up and running. So um, I would definitely have a look at that because we worked really hard on that. Um, that's got all the occlusal lectures and, and a big part of that as well is the videos that you get as well with all the materials on. Um, the implant course will be relaunching in September. So that's the implant course that um, myself and Robert Adams have done before. So we'll keep you updated on that, but we're in the final throes of just getting that ready. Um, the next hands-on for the PG Cert Level 1 will be September 10th um, after the summer holidays. And I think there is still space on the advanced um, PG Level 2 hands-on, which starts February 14th, 15th, 16th. But do remember to be eligible for that course. You do have to have completed the Level 1. The second hands-on session for that is in May 23rd, 24th and 25th. So those sessions will be with myself. There'll be the BioClear uh, Clear Practicals with Claire, um, Orthodontics with Sean um, and Peter and also the laboratory aspects as well. Okay. Um, just go to the website. That's got all the details on there. And obviously there's a number of free videos now and you can just go on to dominichassel.uk um, to get those videos as well. Um, I think that's about everything really. Um, yeah, the PG Cert Online Level 1 is open to purchase now. And yes, first module will be uh, released 5th of February. What are we going to look at this evening um, for the next kind of 40 minutes? I really want to go through what is a really important part of restorative dentistry, which is current trends and techniques for predictable tooth whitening. Um, and certainly today I've been in clinic all day today and two of my patients who are both having restorative work, um, you know, they're, they're actively wanting tooth whitening. So what I want to look at this evening is kind of, you know, how do we deliver basically pain free, predictable tooth whitening, but deliver the best results for our patients. So really, don't forget, tooth whitening really fits in with the kind of, you know, the ethos that I've always had with restorative dentistry, which really is, you know, comprehensive oral health care and really looking at improving appearance, but not just looking at appearance, looking at function as well, and making sure that we have the function there and we preserve or improve dental health. And I think that's at the root of really, you know, aesthetic dentistry. And certainly I've been really teaching that for, for 15, 20 years now. And I am seeing that that's really come through now with a lot of teaching and a lot of courses and a lot of ethos. So don't forget there, there very much now is a change in cosmetic procedures. Um, it's interesting to look at general cosmetic operations. And there has been a 40% drop off. If you look at data from the British Association of aesthetic plastic surgeons, a 40% drop off in cosmetic operations. So by that, I mean basically people going under the knife. There is still a great demand for cosmetic procedures, but what we're finding is people are very much looking for minimal options. So people are looking for composite restorations. Certainly here, we're doing a lot of, you know, mill only um, zirconia, um, quite a lot of press only um, Emacs. So people are looking more and more for the most minimally invasive option. So obviously whitening fits in perfectly with that as well. So 
within dentistry, the, you know, the rise of Botox, um, the rise of tooth whitening, all of these more minimally invasive options are really coming to the front. What else is there? Well, you know, certainly within with our courses, we teach the BioClear composites. And we're finding that we are really overwhelmed um, with people searching out this because it's such a minimally invasive form of treatment. In addition to that, what else have we got? We've got the short term um, orthodontics, which is really more aesthetically focused um, and bringing results around in a quicker time. And also not just in a quicker time, but also with a lower cost option as well. Certainly, I'm still involved with the specialist orthodontics in delivering more complex cases with comprehensive ortho as well. And don't forget this. I know people are watching this around the world, but certainly within the UK, regulation is a big thing. And certainly with the General Dental Council and the defence unions, they want us to be doing risk based dentistry. So they want us to be looking at the risk level of the procedures we're doing, how invasive they are, but particularly from a medico legal aspect um, and also a moral aspect, we need to be delivering really the most minimally invasive options for the patients and really trying to push them down that route there. So certainly really, you know, something that I've been doing for 15, 20 years is, is whiten, align, and then and or composite bonding. And certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what's been very pleasing within the UK over the last five, 10 years, is I've seen the kind of the profession catching up with this. And people who've been on my course is really looking at white and aligning bonding. And so the biologic cost for these options is very, very low, but whitening is a very big part of that. And also within the course, you know, we've got quite a lot of um, educational material on this is the BioClear um, composites as well. Traditional composites now kind of falling by the wayside. And this kind of concept of, you know, biofilm removal, the infinity margin, the anatomical matrix, the heated overbuild, and then the polish back to give you restorations that really can, you know, really rival ceramics and have a really good um, lifespan. But a big part of that is a, most of these BioClear patients and most of my restorative patients are having tooth whitening as part of the procedure. And certainly don't be scared to ask your patients about tooth whitening. The demand is there for it. And risk is a big part of dentistry. The, the risk has to be communicated to the patient. So one thing that's been pleasing for me is that I've been teaching on risk factors for veneers um, for many, many years, and that's kind of caught on in the profession. And so, you know, the risk for whitening and bonding, the risk for that is a lot lower than the risk for veneers. So this slide always kind of makes me laugh. There's the guy kind of going across the Grand Canyon on, on a tightrope. So there's, there's a pretty high level of risk there all the way over to the guy who sat on the tree sawing off the branch where the level of risk is just stupid and unacceptable and the middle kind of picture just kind of is really talking about better to have a difficult conversation at the start of the treatment rather than at the end of the treatment so really whitening fits in with basically the fact that we really need to be doing our low risk um, and really a move away from veneers. Problem with veneers, in, in the right cases, they can work very, very well, a very high success rate, but there is a really long list of possible complications. And while we can get success rates of 90% over 10 years, 75% over 15 years, we can get success rates of as low as 50%. And also, you know, the problem with veneers, if we're doing heavy preps, et cetera, is the risk to the endodontics. Um, and the fact that we may maybe have to do endodontic treatment on, on 10 or percent or more of these teeth. And obviously the patient should be concerned before that. So here's just some of the risk factors for veneers. And I, I won't go into those in detail because I really want to focus on whitening tonight. 
But a part, big part of my job over the last 10 years has really been sorting out other people's veneer cases, where they've been done and they didn't look at the tooth-based, they didn't look at the occlusion-based risk factors. And about real like, catastrophic um, consequences of inappropriate veneers. And really, these patients should have been treated with perhaps pre-restorative ortho, whitening, composite bonding, and then a lot of these complications could have been avoided. So what are we going to look at this evening? We're going to look at a number of issues with tooth whitening. Let's clarify the legal position and also some of the slight ambiguities. Um, let's briefly look at how it works. And what I want to focus in on is kind of techniques and products that I use that reduce sensitivity, um, reduce complications, and basically give you, you know, the optimum result for your patients. You end up with a satisfied patient at the end of the day. I'll also consider um, non-vital bleaching at the end of the session as well. So feel free to post any questions as I go through. Um, don't be offended if I don't answer your question. It might well be that I'm coming to it later on, or it might be that we get two or, two or three questions that are very similar, and I'll kind of pick one as an example. Also, I know we've got people joining us from all around the UK and all around the world. Don't forget, in terms of the legal position, very much what I'm focusing on is the um, legal position within the UK at the moment. So do take this into consideration. That this is probably going to be different from the country that you're practicing in. Um, so why whiten? Well, you know, the reasons are plenty of studies that show that lighter smiles are perceived as younger and more attractive. So that sets up the demand for patients to want tooth whitening, basically because their smile will be perceived as younger, more attractive, and it's kind of synonymous with um, health as well. The psychological benefits of cosmetic or aesthetic dentistry can often be um, underestimated. And certainly, you know, over the years, I've seen people who have had um, dentistry done that has an aesthetic or a cosmetic element to it and certainly it can really work wonders for their self-confidence and their self-esteem as well and also the way they act in um, social interactions as well and you know uh, in, in some respects this is kind of a sad world that we live in but patients who have had tooth whitening and have a, a attractive teeth you know, they, they, they are more likely to get um, success at a job interview and things like this. So, you know, there are a number of reasons why patients would want whitening and why we would want to provide it as well. So don't forget our most basic method of tooth lightening is, you know, don't forget we have things like the, the product that we use in the practice um, is the EMS, the Airflow Ease On Master, and that provides absolutely fantastic stain removal. So a lot of patients I see, um, patients who maybe haven't seen a dentist in years, um, the, you know, the more anxious patients who then pluck up the courage to come and have the dentistry done. And all the, a lot of those patients need is they need calculus removal, that improves the gum health. Then they have periodontal care. But a big part of that um, basically is the airflow. And the kind of sodium bicarbonate powder that we use for the airflow is fantastic at lightening teeth. Um, that, along with the peas on scalar, is absolutely um, fantastic for basically just lightening their natural color and providing them with a better smile as well. Don't forget as well, before any course of whitening treatment, you should be undertaking this as well, so that the whitening product is not having to dis uh, dissolve the extrinsic stains on the teeth. It's getting straight into the tooth um, and working straight on the tooth. So what's the current UK legal? Now, really, everybody should be aware, since the change in the clarification of the law, um, it's 6% hydrogen peroxide or the equivalent of is the maximum concentration. That also, don't forget, includes non-vital as well. The good thing is that any product that contains 0.1% hydrogen peroxide 
should only be sold to dental professionals. However, don't forget people are traveling a lot and don't forget the internet as well. So what we've got to be careful with and actually trying to get our patients to avoid doing is you know, purchasing project, uh, products abroad and purchasing internet products because some of these you know, are either ineffective I'll come some, some later, but which are effective, but they can actually be, you know, really not, you're not getting what you think you're getting, and they can be very, very damaging. So don't forget that only really dentists should be providing tooth whitening, or within the UK, the hygienist or the therapist, but under the guidance of the dentist and under the prescription of the dentist, okay? And if trained and competent, so do make sure that if you're delegating it out, they've been on an appropriate course and you've actually spent some time with them as well. Um, the law is quite clear. It should only be undertaken on patients of 18 or over, but there has been clarification that it can be undertaken on a child if it's in the best interest of the child. But my advice would be certainly to contact your defence union before you before undertake you that, that, get clearance clear with your defense, defense union first. Okay. Also, um, there is some ambiguity that you can use 6% if it's in the best interest of your patient. Again, Again I, would I would contact your defense, defense union, union, who I think will really probably advise you not to do that. I know some people are using higher strength than 6%. My advice would be, you know, be careful with that stay within the 6% or equivalent of, and then you should be fine. Okay. You must, within the UK, carry out an examination prior to a course of tooth whitening, and that would include appropriate x-rays and a periodontal examination and a caries examination and a tooth wear examination and, and detailed, detailed records should be kept. Do, Do explain, explain the, the risks, risks and the benefits to the patient. Now, generally, the benefits are this is non-invasive, relatively, relatively painless, quick treatment. The risks are, obviously, there are the risks of tooth sensitivity and gingival irritation as well. In amongst that, look out for things like white spots or striations. Now, they will become more prominent, okay, before they blend in with the tooth. And obviously warning them that crowns and fillings won't whiten. And do make sure that your patient is dentally fit. So if you're somebody in the practice who is actually taking the kind of referrals for the whitening, it's your responsibility to make sure that the patient, as far as you're concerned, is dentally fit. Okay, so everybody should be happy with this. 6% hydrogen, Peroxide is the maximum within the UK, or 16% carbonite. So hopefully everybody's happy with that. Um, how does whitening work? Well, basically, as we age, particularly, the teeth are porous and they absorb browning products. Now, these are often kind of termed melanoids or chromogens, and they build up intrinsically within the tooth. And don't forget also that the tooth builds up extrinsic um, stain over time. The tooth may lay down reactionary or secondary dentine. And so what we get is this buildup of these browning products within the tooth. Hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent. This penetrates into the tooth and these large molecules, what it effectively does is shatter them up and either they are less dense or they dissolve out of the tooth. So basically then, you know, they, they absorb less light and it lightens the tooth, okay? So the value gets lighter, but also the basic hue can change as well. Typically in a younger patient, an A shade would then turn to, tend to turn into a B shade as the browns come out of the tooth and the more yellowness of the dentine shows through. So, you know, what are the considerations with whitening? Well, it's non-invasive, relatively inexpensive, relatively quick, 
And it is a good entry point for people to get into aesthetic dentistry. Once they go into whitening, they then tend to be more prone to be having cosmetic fillings. And so they tend to then go more for um, composite fillings rather than amalgam or restoration such as that. So it does tie in with our bioclear composites. What else are there? Well, do look out for legal practice. Um, and if you do see a legal practice, really, you know, you should be bringing that to the attention of the GDC because it should only be dentists who are doing it. Anybody else who's doing it, if they're not doing it illegally, um, then they're using a 0.1% product, which is ineffective. Um, do look out for online products as well. I really discourage patients from using online products. Um, and sensitivity is a major issue, and we'll come on to that later. That's why companies are bringing out um, products specifically um, to look at um, sensitivity issues and try and ensure that we don't get sensitivity during our whitening. So what are some other issues? Sensitivity is a major issue. And don't forget, your patient will experience gingival irritation as well due to the carbamide peroxide or the hydrogen peroxide. What else does whitening do? It does roughen, roughen and soften the enamel, no doubt about that. All of the studies in vitro show that that is a temporary uh, measure, okay? There is increased potential for demineralization, and in vitro studies do, do show some degradation of restorations. Um, however, however, that is very, very small. And minor color changes, um, basically, in restorations, but all of these are very, very minor. So the, a, lot a lot of these things you hear about surface roughening, demineralization, degradation, um, of restorations. There is an element of the truth in all of that, but none, none of it has ever been shown to be of any clinical significance. Okay, and the vast majority of studies indicate that it is safe um, systemically as well. Um, it does appear to be ten temporarily detrimental to bond strength. Studies vary a lot. Some studies show that it's not, some studies show that it is. Um, and some studies up to two weeks that it can be detrimental to bond strength. So the consensus, although there isn't a great deal of evidence based on that, is you would wait at least two weeks before bonding. However, my experience is color stability is affected anyway. A lot of people say four weeks, but I tend to try and wait six weeks for shade taking and then placing composites or in direct restorations. There is, there is some, some effect, effect on bond strength, strength of existing restorations, restorations but no evidence, evidence that this is clinical, clinically significant, and it does not appear to significantly affect the color of composites. It does take surface stain off, so composites after whitening, actually sometimes when you polish them, they don't always need replacing. Now, now let's, let's have a little look at non-professional whitening products first, because your patients will ask you about these, and they are really widespread on the internet as well. What's the ones that do work? Well, whitening strips do work. Now, within the USA, some are popular, and some of them are approved by the American Dental Association, and they are 10% carbamide. Um, the one that is quite popular within the USA, USA um, is the Crest Supreme, Supreme, and that is a 14% hydrogen peroxide strip. And basically what they are, um, it's a thin layer of peroxide gel on a plastic strip, strip and then, and then these, these are shaped over the buccal surfaces. Um, do they, do they work? work? Yes, yes, they, they will, will work because the concentration is high enough. And you know, I do have states and buy them in the states or people who get them off the um, internet within the UK. One consideration with those is that obviously at the gingival level they don't they don't really get at that area. So one thing I would say that is definitely an issue is essentially that you know the whitening around the neck of the teeth tends to be quite poor and also, it tends to cover quite a lot of the gingivae if they want to get the neck, so you can get quite a lot of gingival irritation. 
Um, whitening rinses, uh, really, um, generally it's considered that the concentration of hydrogen peroxide is so low that they are likely to be ineffective. Um, and also don't forget there are toxicity issues with these. So you don't want your patients swallowing large amounts of it. And if they have children or pets, they need to keep these out of the way. But generally they, they contain things such as hydrogen peroxide, but general consensus is, although there's a lot of them around, is they're not really that effective. So let's get on to um, professional whitening. And really the two main methods that pre predominate now is the tray whitening, and we tend to do a 10% carbamide overnight. Or you can kickstart that within the UK with a, a chair side whitening product as well. Certainly those of you who are looking from abroad, um, you still will probably be able to use the highest strength hydrogen peroxides, kind of about 35% uh, over an hour to kickstart the whitening pro process. Generally, I tend to prefer carbamide peroxide because um, generally, um, you know, generally because you will get less sensitivity with it. If you've had patients who've had hydrogen peroxide before um, with no um, problems, then it's fine to use. But there are significant problems with sensitivity with patients. Um, now, one thing with whitening to consider is the basic science. So whitening will improve with higher concentrations, it will get you there quicker. Now, within the UK, certainly we're limited in terms of concentration, and also the higher concentrations do tend to give more sensitivity in some patients. One thing that really the companies have worked on to some degree is alkalinity. So increased alkalinity um, basically uh, improves the whitening process but it basically reduces the sh shelf life of the product. Um, so a couple of questions coming through at the moment. What whitening product would you recommend? I am um, going to um, come on to a couple of products in a bit. And what is the current advice on whitening for pregnant women? Uh, basically, um, don't do it, okay? Um, without a doubt, people are going to ingest um, some of the whitening product. Also with women, they're very prone, obviously during um, pregnancy to pregnancy gingivitis. So the risk of gingival irritation is normal as well. well. So, so um, with pregnant women, I would avoid it until um, the pregnancy is over. And to some degree, it would probably be wise to actually not, not do it until, until they finish breastfeeding as well, would be, would be my current kind of guidance on that. Trouble is with cheaper bleaches, <clears throat> this is why it's worth investing in a good product. Um, the more acidic bleaches have a better shelf life. So it's important you choose a product and you look at the shelf life and really it shouldn't have a shelf life of, of beyond a few months really. The other way of improving um, whitening is to actually heat it or warm it. And that was why some of the um, kind of laser whitening lights were popular because they produce some warmth as well. However, all of these kind of laser lights, none of these were shown to have any influence whatsoever really on the whitening process. So what do you want to look for? You want to look for a good quality bleach, not a thin ruddy bleach, not a bleach with a long shelf life either. And the other thing that you need to do is very good patient compliance and education on how to do it. And I think what I've seen over the years is poor tray construction, poor alginate impressions, and then a poor tray, underextended, or poor fitting, and the bleach just leaches away. Now, don't forget that the teeth become more porous during the whitening process. So it's very important that you get your patients to stay away from smoking, they stay away from coffee, they stay away from things like green tea and anything with tannins in it. 
and certainly stay away from highly colored food um, such as curries. Other thing as well, older patients, certainly when they get into their kind of 40s, 50s or beyond, the teeth do whiten less well. They are more resistant to whitening. A lot of that being that it's things like secondary density that's going on. Um, and don't forget, sensitivity increases um, with the acidity of the bleach and also a low water content. So one of the products I'm going to recommend in a bit has is very alkaline and very hydrated as well. So you will get less sensitivity with it. Okay. So what are the products now? The product I I I like and I've worked with um, Octodent for a long time on this is the white um, dental beauty, the Novon. Now they do a range of um, gels Octodent, all of which are particularly alkaline. But now what they do do is they do a full range of gels. They do a six percent hydrogen, which can be used for thirty to ninety minutes. So those people who have time during the day for a quick, short, sharp shock of it. They can actually do that twice a day as well. A 16% carbamide that they could wear for one to two hours. And again, they can double up on that and do it twice a day. For most patients, um, basically, um, the 10% carbamide works very well. And they can wear that for two to four hours or overnight. So don't forget whitening, very enzymic. So most of the reaction happens very, very quickly. And then what I, I certainly am using a fair degree of, um, I tend to see a lot of patients who get sensitivity. There is now a 5% carbon um, from Octodent, and that works very, very well on patients who have had sensitivity. So if you have a patient who comes in and they previously had to abandon whitening or they have to abandon it while you're doing it, when we switch them over to the 5%, it does mean that they can often continue for the, for a number of days to get a better result. So the Octodent product, um, the Novon, very good. It's very, very alkaline. Um, so basically increases the effectiveness of the whitening for faster whitening. So for the same percentage compared to a more acidic product, you actually get faster and better whitening. And they reduce the acidity in it so you get reduced sensitivity as well. What they've also done, and I'll talk about sensitivity in a minute, is up the water content. So there is reduced osmolarity, reduced fluid movement in the tubules, so you get less sensitivity. Um, quick um, question that's just come up. What would you tell a patient who has tetracycline staining regarding the time it will take to whiten? Um, it will take a long time. Now, with tetracycline staining, the study is looking from three weeks um, up to several months. So those patients would be the ones to use a 5% on or a low percentage carbamide, but they have to continue it over a long period and they will need to use desensitizers with it. However, with tetracycline staining, definitely remember, uh, remember I would advise whitening. Tetracycline staining can be quite tricky. I've seen cases treated with veneers in the past. You start prepping for the veneers. You then get to this dentine that's very dark and poor to bond to often. And so you can have problems with veneers in terms of masking and bonding. OK, um, another question. What will you do advise for day whitening in preference to white light whitening in bruxis? I haven't got round to that, but as part of your examination, check for bruxis. Um, not really any studies on this particularly, but bruxis do get more sensitivity. So again, don't forget we've got the 5% gel. Now everybody be thinking, well, 5% it's not going to work. But the 5% Novon is more alkaline, so it's more effective. And it's got a higher water context, so less sensitivity and less acidic. So you can do these lower strengths, but you may have to do them for two or three weeks, okay? But you can get to the same end point for them. Um, so, you know, don't forget sensitivity, it's a problem. 
Um, very good review article by Treadwin in the BDJ uh, back in 2006. And studies report sensitivity to be anything from 15 up to 80%. So, you know, if you're having problems with sensitivity, it could be that the bleach you're using is just a cheap, acidic, non-hydrated bleach. If you're not getting problems, stick with the product you're using. If you are, we found that Novon is a very, very good um, product. A uh, very good question. Somebody who works with the um, Asian community and they have Sapari stains. Um, have you come across this? Yes. Does work whitening work around these types of stains? Basically, no. Um, you need to get in, which is I think slide six or seven. Brilliant product. Look at the uh, EMS, look at the perio flow and the airflow. You basically need to get in with that, do the so sodium bicarbonate do the um, ultrasonic scaling, get rid of all those stains, and then you can go um, back in with the whitening and it will whiten very well. I must admit that they are, when I've treated these patients, they are similar to smokers though, and the staining can come back very, very quickly. Um, so that they're difficult to treat. Basically, those patients would be better treated on a, on a kind of three monthly, um, kind of super gingival stain removal program. Do remember though, um, there, are, there, there is evidence suggesting that the patients who go into a three monthly scaling program, they can be more prone to things like recession. So if they're not prone to calculus buildup, I would recommend going in with something quite gentle like the perio um, and the airflow with sodium bicarb to more remove the stain for them. That works very, very well. Um, and big important thing, um, essentially with shade selection, try and nail what the patient wants. Now there's a slide here, OM, B1, A1. OM is often going to take you four weeks or so. Um, you may, if you're still using it, be needing a deep bleach protocol for these patients. B1, B1 might well take, take you about three, three weeks, weeks. A1, A1 about, about two, two weeks. weeks. So try and establish what are they looking for? Are they looking for just a, an improvement of about one and a half shades, maybe two shades? Do they want to get to B1 or do they want to get up into this kind of, you know, the kind of Ryland look, this very light white shade? Okay, because it will take longer. And don't forget, older teeth, less predictable, takes longer warn the patient. Okay. Um, another really good question is what effect does it cause on hypomineralized spots? What I what tends to work well for hypomineralized spots is do the whitening, but there is a very good sensitivity product called um, GC tooth mousse um, or the latest version of that that contains fluoride, which is GC MI paste, which is a GC product very popular in northern europe so what you do is you do the whitening and essentially these white spots will become brighter to start with and stand out because they're more porous and a very good treatment is then you put in the trays for about an hour or so a day with the mi paste or the gc tooth mousse and this tends to harmonize these off more quickly so not only is it very effective for for um, basically um, treating the sensitivity, but also harmonizing out the spots as well. And does the hypomineralized spots, do they become brighter? Yes, they do stand out. They're more porous, you see. So basically, um, they will stand out. As the whitening progresses, they harmonize. Do, do remember, remember, if the patient abandons the whitening mid treatment due to sensitivity, these kind of white spots you get will stand out and they could take weeks to settle back down, but they will settle back down. Um, how much whitening solution would you give for a course of treatment? Um, depends how white they want to go. You know, it's literally the slide we've got now. A1 a couple of weeks, B1 three weeks, OM four weeks. So if you want to get up to OM, you really need to be increasing the cost because you're going to use more products. And generally, I would give them the products, instruct them fully on the products, and review them in two weeks. 
what you don't want is they don't um, they don't basically if they're gonna if they're gonna do two weeks you don't want them to kind of get to two weeks stop see you <clears> three weeks and start again so review them at two weeks or get them to come in it only takes five minutes if they've run out of gel and yeah if the case is going to take four weeks you've got to charge more because they're going to need extra gel you're probably going to take more clinical time and review them twice as well so, so do, do bear, bear that in mind okay so establish um how right the patient wants to go okay um longer protocols you might well get more sensitivity as well so just have a little peek at that tray design is crucial now do make sure that you take good quality alginates make sure that you have a tray that's deep and it gets right up into the soft tissues one of the biggest problems i see is poor alginate impressions that the impression is underextended the tray is underextended next problem is basically that the alginate is coming away from the tray and then what you have is an issue then the just the tray just doesn't fit and it's not vacuum formed properly so your tray should be extended over onto the gingivae and they should be tight on the teeth if they're not don't use them finally generally if you are using carbamide you want a buccal reservoir in wax and as you can see with the middle slide the lab indent model at the gingival margin so that when the tray goes on it sucks on and it keeps more of the peroxide in contact with the tooth for longer okay so the other question we've had does external bleaching help for hyperplastic enamel brown spots generally they're brown spots because they're stained so basically with those what can work very well is you can kind of etch them okay so what i would do is micro abrade them etch them and polish them prior to the whitening and do that so here we are um basically a tray that's underextended a poor outed impression your trays are going to be poor and the results won't be good okay um which lab do you use for whitening trays was the next question i have used a number of labs over the years um the trays that come um from my local lab which is am ceramics in sutton coalfield um, i use them predominantly because their lab their trays are very very good quality um i'll come on to some other trays in a bit from various companies as well um, but Optident do trays as well, which I've used in the past, which are, are good quality. Um, but it really is just making sure that you've got that kind of suction on them when you fit them. And they're fitting tightly and they're scored around the gums. And then, then you should, should be fine. The other trays um, that I've used in the past, which are very good quality, are the trays from Enlighten as well. So it's a matter of finding really a local lab that you have really good quality trays. Okay. Um, whitening is a major issue as we looked at earlier with whitening. So what do you want to do? You want to bleach with a high water content so that, that the, basically the moisture isn't being sucked out of the tubules and then you get irritation in the tooth. And you also want an alkaline bleach as well which reduces sensitivity more sensitivity if there's restorations recession parafunction all the studies show that and how do you treat it really um, most companies tend to go for something like potassium nitrate and that is a product which reduces nerve excitability a number of companies do that it's in a cotton wool bud and Centrotrol do these birds, you click one end, you have it on the tooth, and they can literally wipe it on the tooth. So potassium nitrate works very well. The product that I'm very keen on is GC Tooth Mousse or GCMI paste. And this is just a cream 
you can sell this onto your patients. It's not in the BNF. You can sell it on privately for approximately 15 pounds a tube. Comes in watermelon, all different types of really nice flavors. Um, and basically that can be put into the same tray and they wear that for up to an hour. That really does help with sensitivity. It also helps with white spots on the teeth as well. So GC Tooth Mousse is a product we've used for years. It has been updated recently to GCMI paste. Now that, apart from the casein phosphopeptide and the kind of amorphous calcium phosphate, that delivers calcium and phosphate ions. The MI paste has fluoride in it, so it also delivers fluoride as well. So that product, very, very good. Um, I haven't used deep bleach protocols for a while, very much because the new Optident bleach um, is, is very good in terms of getting excellent results. But the deep bleach protocol and the evolution systems by Enlighten are certainly a product I would also recommend that I have used in the past. Okay. Um, the theory behind this was that you would do 10% for a week, 16% for a week, and then you would do a 6% hydrogen for an hour in the surgery at the end of week two. And then they can continue for the hydrogen if you if you don't get the whitening you want, but it used to guarantee B1, still does, and every time I've used it, I've got to B1. If they want to get to OM, then you do need to continue for a little bit longer, okay? Um, so that's the kind of results you can get with the deep bleach protocol. This is a patient that, you know, did about a month of it. We got them up to that OM shade. Now that doesn't actually tend to require more topping up. It tends to super saturate the teeth. So I do find that often people worry, well, if I really whiten them, is it gonna be a big problem? Am I gonna be continually whitening? No, they're probably gonna to need topping up about once every year to two years for a little while, okay? Uh, quick questions come in. Do you demo applying the bleach to the tray and place it in the patient's mouth? Uh, yeah. Uh, medico legally, I think you've got to do that. You've got to demo it and make sure that they can do it. Okay. Uh, another uh, question is the GC mousse um, to be used before or after the whitening gel? Uh, spit chicken and egg, that doesn't matter. Doesn't affect the whitening process, just use it at a different time. So if they're doing the whitening gel overnight, just get them to wear the tray with the GC tooth mousse for about an hour during the day and that should calm down the sensitivity for them. Um, there are power whitening products. Um, Philips Zoom really is the one that um, is popular in the UK. I would charge something in the region of about 850 to do that and a take home kit. Um, and it is a 6% hydrogen, but it has this pH booster swab Generally, a, a course of treatment would take about an hour and a quarter, hour and a half. And what it does is it kick starts the process, but you still do need to take home after. Um, it also contains, uh, comes with the Zoom light. I personally am not convinced that the Zoom light is particularly effective, but certainly these pH booster swabs, they increase the alkalinity and the bleach will work better but send them home with, a, with a, a kit as well to continue the whitening because a lot of the initial change will be dehydration, okay? Uh, quick question, how many days do they use the top-up gel for until the color harmonizes, basically? Two or three days maximum is all they would need to top up. Um, some of my patients top up every couple of years, some um, every so often. Um, does Sensodyne affect the efficacy of the whitening? Now, don't forget, there are a number of Sensodyne products. What you want to do, unfortunately, is almost you've got to stay away from a product that blocks the tubules because that's, you know, that, that in some respects can affect the whitening. So um, depends what Sensodyne toothpaste it is, but generally most of them would not really significantly affect um, the whitening. You should be able to continue with, with a Sensodyne toothpaste, to be honest with you. Okay. 
Um, if you do do the power whitening, um, basically then they are recommending dam um, and isolation for the Zoom products as well. So do consider that. Um, so again, with the power whitening, got to have a take home kit as well, because a lot of the initial results will be dehydration. So very important detailed instructions for the whitening. We have written instructions that they take home and we make sure before they leave the surgery that they have everything clear and that they can do it. Very, very important. Also do a pre-op photo with the shade tab for a, a medico legal record and patients very quickly forget how kind of dark their teeth were. Every, I, I, you know, I've seen several patients this week who have done whitening and they're like, oh, um, I thought it would be whiter. You get the shade tab up and you do find that they've gone a couple of Vita shades um, higher. Refrain from tea, coffee, tobacco, red wine. We've covered that. Um, clean the teeth and rinse thoroughly pre and post whitening is very important. A uh, quick question, what about patients with severe gingival recession, RE sensitivity? Um, unfortunately, they will get more um, and they will probably need the 5% gel. Um, if the light is not effective and it's only the 6% hydrogen peroxide with the alkaline boost, how is it any different to the take home white dental beauty um, effectively the light may have a modest benefit if it warms things up um, and how is it different to the take-home kit basically what you do with the ph booter swap you put it on makes it very alkaline and you repeat that during the process so basically what you make what you're making sure is that it's a very alkaline environment more alkaline than the take-home kit. So it's basically a more alkaline environment. Um, and do you routinely check the fit of trays before selling whitening top-ups? Um, yeah, I think, you know, you know, if you've, you've made the trays, then you should know they fit. Um, don't forget there's all these different products, they can make their own trays, okay? Um, and it just asking, would you or do you check every sale of top up gels? You should only provide the top up gels if they are dentally fit. So if they've lapsed out of their recall period, do not provide the whitening gels. They need to come back in. Yeah, they need to come back in and have a dental examination. So it's important that reception are just not handing out gels to patients. They need to come in and see the dentist. That's very important. Um, do you cover tooth whitening in detail in your courses? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, and certainly with the courses, don't forget for questions, if you're here on the course, you can ask questions personally. If you're doing the online course, you can put them on the forum as well. So I just encourage people to use the forum as well. Um, Boutique versus Polar, do these give good results? It's very, very difficult for me to comment on all of the products. Um, boutique, very good results with that. Um, the Polar, I must admit, I am less familiar with, but it does look to be um, a quality product. The main thing is look at the product you're using. If you're getting good results, stick with it. If you're not, move on. OK, so that was just remind me to tell you, get the pre and post op shade tab. And here I'm not going to go through this because we're running short on time. But do just remember on that list, point eight, metallic products, amalgam corrosion. That's not going to whiten so well because it, it's metallic and it won't bleach. So kind of amalgam corrosion products not going to work very well. Make sure you get signed consent. And I think all of the other points I've considered. OK. Finally, in out bleaching, um, do bear in mind in out bleaching is variable. Um, some people are using higher strength gels for that, but just be careful of that. But what we're tending to do now is open up the access cavity 
get the tray made and you put the gel in that tooth so you get the bleaching on the outside and the inside. There is a very small risk of cervical resorption, but the majority of the studies where you get that, it's often been due to a poor quality root filling. So make sure that the root filling is excellent quality and seal over the access cavity with a small amount of something like resin modified GIC. Okay, so you can see this slide here, root filling is sealed over, and you can see with the middle picture, you leave that open, and the patient is instructed to brush and clean and rinse in there. And basically what I generally do is I send them away with a carbamide 16% or hydrogen, and basically see them on a Monday, they can change the bleach two or three times a day, and basically get them back by the end of the week. And when it's basically over lightened slightly, you can stop then and then seal up the access. Warn them to have a soft diet because as you can see, the tooth is weakened structurally because there's a hole um, in the back of it. So in out bleaching tends to be um, the preferred method. Obviously when we had high strength gels, we would seal in the high strength gel and seal it in and leave it for a little while. But I find in out bleaching, the results are variable. Most cases it works well, some cases it doesn't work well, and some cases the color does tend to go dark again. Um, however, if you've placed them like a veneer on the tooth, you can open up the back of the tooth again and they can bleach it again. So um, we'll kind of call it a day there because we were here for an hour and we're nearly in an hour now. Um, thanks for um, all of the questions. There's been some really good questions tonight. Inevitably, when I stop in a couple of minutes, somebody will think of something. So if you do have any questions, just email them through to um, dom at dominichassel.co.uk. So that dom, D-O-M, at Dominic Hassel, so D-O-M-I-N-I-C-H-A-S-S-A-L-L, -L, or you can find me on, on social media. So I hope that's been useful for you um, this evening, um, and hopefully I'll see or hear from some of you in the near future, and obviously we'll keep you updated on when the next webinar will be. Okay, so if there's no more questions, thanks to everybody, and I'll speak to you soon. Good night then.